The FEF series is a limited run of 45 locomotives built by Alco for the Union Pacific during the time period of 1937 to 1944. The FEF series was built into three different classes designated by a number with minor cosmetic and mechanical changes between the series. Originally, every FEF burned coal, but all locomotives were converted to burning fuel oil by 1946 and were last steam engines delivered to the UP. Originally, the FEFs pulled famous UP name trains, but were later assigned to freight service. Steam would eventually be phased out, and the first FEFs were to be retired in 1956, and the second to last was retired in 1962. UP-844 is the only Class 1 steam engine to never retire, and it was moved to excursion services in 1960 and continued to today. Several examples survive today, ranging from excursion service to static display, and one is deemed to be a spare parts bin for UP-844. Broadway Limited announced the production of the FEF Class 3 steam engine in May of 2021, and dealers took delivery in December of that same year. BLI has several offerings in the Class 3 for different time frames and different details for the individual or modeler's needs. Today we'll be taking a look at UP-844 and the modern excursion scheme, with the major distinctions being the wind wings and lacking a Mars light per the prototype. The FEF was only produced for Union Pacific, and such UP is the only offered road name, with two major paint schemes and a total of seven road numbers in the run. The MSRP on the model is a penny short of $700, but significant discounts can be found through local hobby shops. The detail level on the locomotive is incredible with the newly tooled locomotive and a vast array of upgrades across the board. Starting off at the head of the steamer is the feature that arguably stands out the most is the brass bell on the top end of the boiler. The bell is actually a brass component and freely pivots with enough friction to hold the bell in any position desired. On either side of the bell is the five digit number boards. These are LED backlit operating with the other lighting features. Below the pair of number boards is a pair of class lights. Similarly, these are LED backlit and viewable on three sides with the clear lenses. The front plate of the boiler is extremely well done with the rivet details wrapping around the outer edge and molded on latch details on the inner plate as well. At the center of the boiler plate is the front headlight assembly with the white LED light on the front of the locomotive. The lens of the LED is frosted and gives off a nice even light when rolling down the track. The 844 locomotive numbers are mounted on either side of the headlight assembly and the infamous UP shield just below the headlight as well. Continuing to move down, there are several examples of separately applied plastic grab irons and handrails. The coupler cut bar is another separately applied piece attached to the top of the snow plow assembly. The cut bar follows the contours of the locomotive and jets below the front plow. The entire front plow assembly, including the pilot shield above the plow, are actually die cast metal and contribute the hefty weight of the steamer. 844 plow swivels to reveal a dummy front coupler, but there are extra pieces in the box to install an operational coupler. The main dominating feature of the entire locomotive is the smoke deflectors, or as called by UP, the wind wings. These are separately applied plastic components with rivet details on the lower portions of the deflectors. Under the smoke deflectors are the steam chests that house the slider valves and the pistons. These are black plastic components that have a silver highlighting painting on the edges and smaller molded on details up top. The pilot truck has two axles or four wheels as designated in the first four of the 484 Northern. The pilot truck does not have electrical pickups but does have blackened wheel sets with white highlight painting and the truck stays snug against the rails thanks to a spring between the truck and the truck body. Following the metal drive rods of the steam engine, the rod coming out of the steam chest is the piston rod, which connects to the E-Center crank assembly and the E-Center rod to provide motion back to the slide valves in the steam chest. The piston rods also then connect to the main rods of the main driving force to the wheels. All the 80-inch drivers are connected via the side rods and help provide that 63,000 pounds of tractive effort on the real FEF locomotives. Between the drive wheels are the brake shoes to help slow this beast down and the sanding lines to provide more traction. Overall, the conductor side of the steam engine is filled with molded on and separately applied details. The boiler takes up the majority of the shot with these 484 Northerns requiring a lot of steam to achieve the 5,000 horsepower and thus a larger boiler. The boiler on these models have a ton of molded on rivet details down the side and are the base for other details like the separately applied plastic handrails. Some of the major plumbing across the boiler includes the superheat lines that return the warm steam to the initial feed water and increase the thermal efficiency of the locomotive and lower fuel costs. Some of these superheat lines run down the side of the boiler and jet below the tread walkways halfway down. 
The opposite of the superheat lines is the subcooling lines. The hot water piston pump just below the walkway pumps water to the smoke box to cool the exhaust fumes and prevents the fumes from getting too hot. The eight driving wheels are fitted together from the side rods and have a white paint outline. The last set of drivers have the traction tires installed and a small hex driver is included with the model to remove the drivers and replace the traction tires. Closer to the cabin is the firebox painted silver and underneath the larger portion of the box is a nicely completed with riveting details across the box. The underside of the entire boiler is filled with an additional plumbing. The component just below the cab on the conductor side is the cold water turbine. On the engineer side of the steam locomotive, more of the cab oriented details can be seen. The first of these is the rear cab walking plate that sits between the engine and the tender and allows the crew to have access to the tender with a swivel between the two components. The cab itself is a little bit more difficult to view due to the enclosed doors on the rear, but the locomotive includes two painted cab figures, so no worries about running ghost trains. Underneath the cab is an assortment of piping and plumbing for blowing down the different steam components and the firebox. The trailing truck is similar to the pilot truck, but is more enclosed type, matching the tender trucks. Separately applied details, like a brake cylinder, can be seen attached to the trailing truck. Additional details on the boiler can be seen, like the lever assembly running across the boiler and next to the handrail. The assembly runs from the cab interior to the valving behind the smoke deflectors. Separately applied details under the walkway, like the reverse cylinder, can be seen with an array of connections running from the cab to the cylinder, then back to the reach rod. Smaller molded-on details, like the terminal check valves, can be seen on the steam chest as well. The top of the steamer is one of the most seen views on the locomotive and thankfully is packed full of separately applied and molded on details. The first of these is the dual smokestack, a feature given to the FEF 3 class, but other classes were later updated to or moved on to the triple stacks. The stack is surrounded by separately applied plumbing components with various responsibilities ranging from subcooling to superheating. The whistle is immediately behind the stack and is painted in a flashy gold color. There are two smoking effects on the locomotive. The first of these is located inside the double stack with the smoke unit outputting to both stacks. The other smoke unit is on the whistle smoke effect with a small output hole just below the whistle. Safety relief valves are behind the whistle on the prototype. These lift off when the boiler pressure increases too high to prevent an accidental explosion of the boiler. The large hump in the middle of the boiler is the sand dome that stores sand for later use. This component is molded on into the boiler and thus is also made of the die cast metal. Just below the sand dome is a pair of auxiliary whistles. Similar to the main whistle in the front, these are a brass component but do not feature the whistle smoke effect. Smaller brass details on top also include the pair of generators near the cab compartment on the conductor's side. The cab itself is molded to the boiler and is once again die cast metal, but separately applied plastic pieces like the smoke hatch can be seen as well. The other major component of the steam engine is the tender. The FEF3 is equipped with a 14-wheeled pedestal or centerpiece tender. The tender is connected via a metal drawbar and electrical components are connected via an 8-pin wiring harness. The tops of the sides of the tender are aligned with separately applied plastic hand railing. Towards the fore end of the tender, the top is populated by separately applied details like the fuel oil inspection lids, fuel oil dipstick, and other details associated with the fuel oil system. The modern 844 version also sports a containment dam on top of the tender to prevent any unnecessary spilling of the fuel oil, a feature only found on the modern excursion version. Moving down towards the side of the tender, the most standout feature is the series of rivet details breaking up the smooth-sided black outer shell. Within the rivet details, the separation bulkhead that separates the fuel oil from the bulk water system has a riveted slope towards the front end at a 45-degree angle starting at the top middle of the tender. Some of the separately applied details are the side step ladders between the locomotive and the tender connecting points. The front tender truck separates the foremost two axles from the remaining five axles that make up the centipede portion of the wheel arrangement. The five rear axles, while looking intimidating to modelers with sharper curves, have quite a bit of slack to allow axles to adjust and make curves all the way down to 22 inch radius curves. Towards the rear of the tender, the top of the tender is fitted with three water fill hatches to allow loading from steam era water towers. 
The handrails, as mentioned earlier, continue down the aft section of the tender surrounding the water fill hatches. Sitting atop the upper landing is the rear emergency light, an LED lighting feature for when you guessed it, the locomotive is in emergency. The tender mounted rear light is fitted into the rear bulkhead of the tender and is another LED lighting feature. Similar to the front of the locomotive, the rear has two mounted class lights, and while not operational, the lenses are fitted with either green or red lenses that refract the light to give the illusion of operational LEDs. Allowing access to the top of the landing is the side ladders, a separately applied plastic piece that continues into the plastic grab irons on the top as well. The standard sized KD style metal coupler attached on the rear and several molded on features like grab irons can be viewed on the rear bulkhead. The underside of the steam engine is relatively plain and viewers can find the on off switch to turn on the smoke effect heating element underneath the cab. The 844 locomotive is loaded with the newly released Paragon 4 decoder from the BLI brand and allows the locomotive to operate on DCC or standard DC layouts. The drivetrain is a five-pole can motor with a skew-wound armament, and the vast majority of the model is die-cast for increased tractive efforts. A capacitor pack is installed to allow perfect operations over tract or power issues. The smoking element is synchronized with the chuff sounds and performs variably to the timing and load behind the tender. The smoking effect is turned on by default, and initial fill from the factory lasted approximately 20 minutes of runtime. Now that we've had a good opportunity to check out the FEF Class 3 details, let's go ahead and fire up on the layout.
the 844 really pressed the scales with a weight of 21.58 ounces for just the steam engine portion. The tender adds an additional 15.41 ounces for a grand total of 36.99 ounces or 1,048.65 grams. One of the heaviest locomotives reviewed on the channel, the diecast chassis is really putting in the work. The pulling power of the steamer was equally as impressive with an average pull test of approximately 10 ounces or about 80 to 90 standard freight cars. A good result for the pull test was difficult to achieve due to the chugging of the steamer and the minor differences in the traction tire contact pad. The steamer did have a peak pulling power of close to 13.2 ounces, but values ranged closer to 9 to 11 ounces of pulling for more sustained pulling power. Moving on to the scoring section, the different scoring categories are shown with their respective point values. The model will be scored off these categories, and then a final score will be given in a subsequent letter grade. The packaging of the model is a little bit different from previous BLI releases, as the packaging material is slightly reduced, the plastic outer shell and soft plastic liner are staying, but the outer cardboard box is smaller and utilizes a sleeve and open box design. Overall, still protects the model satisfactory. The 844 has no shortage of photographic evidence with hundreds of photos being available from every excursion run in the last two decades. The unfortunate part is the 844 is an 80-year-old locomotive and thus small changes occur between each run, so the accurate run is 2013+. plus but minor differences may limit it to a smaller range. Judging from the photo evidence, it's most accurate from 2019 and later runs. The paint across the model is nicely done with fine, accurate printing and decals across the model. One of the main attributes of the 844 is the white and silver accent painting across details like the wheels and walkways. The white painting is difficult to achieve over the darker colors like black, but the effect looks good as painted. Another good choice was the graphite on the smoke box and fire box looking very sharp and realistic comparing the model to excursion videos. The engine portion is extremely well done with the initial look and just an incredible amount of finely molded on and separately applied details. These details include the die cast metal pieces, several brass components and the minority being the more standard plastic components. Unfortunately there seems to be several easy and standard details that are missing from this $700 model. One of the more obvious ones is the missing dual train line air hose on the front snowplow, likely omitted due to the diecast snowplow, but very clearly missing when comparing pictures to the prototype. The other major issue is the rear of the tender. It definitely feels like BLI did an amazing job across the locomotive and then basically forgot the rear. The rear lacks the dual standard mounts to the rear bulkhead to service the rear class lights and looks similar to the brake wheel stand found on older boxcars. Other missing details are the rear train line air hoses, rear cut bar, and the majority of the details are molded on to the back plate like the rear grab irons. Ultimately feeling like this is a slap in the face on this otherwise very nicely done model. Overall I took one point for every issue for a total of five points. Moving on to the motor and electronics, the locomotive has serious pulling power and while the Paragon 4 is a major upgrade over older Paragon 3s, the underlying issues are still there. The decoder is much better, but still has its fritz, often forgetting which functions are enabled and basically having to wait for the decoder to rethink and catch itself back up if any shorts or power faults occur on the layout. Nothing preventing the locomotive from running, but the issue occurred more than several times and was getting to the point of annoyance. Resetting back to the default did not fix the issue, and I found myself looking at other options to replace the OEM board. Lighting annoyances was also found. Overall, I actually really like putting all the lighting features on a single decoder function as the vast majority of modelers are probably going to run all the lights or none. The cab light features was also pretty nifty, automatically turning on when the locomotive came to a stop. The frosted lenses of the headlight was an interesting choice. Probably not my initial choice, but I thought it looked good looking down the rails. The lighting features were all LED and in the golden white color, looking good on the modern steamer. Light leaks were an issue on the class lights and the number boards and the rear class lights did not have a lighting feature on them. Slightly disappointing for all three of these. Overall, I took away six points, three for the decoder issues and three for the lackluster lighting features. 
Only the rear coupler is installed out of the box and a swivel mounted dummy coupler is on the front plow. The rear coupler is a standard size metal coupler. Disappointing though, not a scale coupler on an otherwise high quality model. When the standard coupler was installed on the front plow, both the front and rear couplers were at the correct height. All three trucks are sprung, keeping the wheels tucked up onto the rail, and all the wheels were found to be engaged. I only removed one point for the non-scale coupler on an otherwise $700 model. The value is generally very much up to the individual modeler, but BLI offers a great piece at an appropriate price. Other manufacturer examples have been very difficult to find or are in less than perfect condition, and this release should put a relief on the FEF Northern market for a bit. That being said, this piece comes in at an MSRP of $700, and modelers should be able to pick them up for about mid $500, and perfection should be nearly achievable for that price. As mentioned beforehand, of all the details and electronics, fall a little bit short to an otherwise great model. And for the miscellaneous section, the model is incredibly detailed, but has some issues on that part. Looking great with the accuracy and the paint, and the model sounds and pulls very nicely with some minor flaws across the board. I did take away a few points from the miscellaneous section due to the missed opportunities and letdowns along the way. Telling up all the points gives us an 84 out of 100 or a solid B rating. Comparing the score to other model scores, the 844 lands pretty low on the list, but is the only steamer and thus has a little bit more potential to lose points. Overall, the score fits the model pretty well in my opinion as the model did relatively well but falls short in several categories across the board and I feel like it's a good starting point for this initial FEF run. BLI definitely brought their A game with this model bringing out all the bells and whistles literally but the execution just seems to fall short. To me, it seems that the model is approximately 95% complete with several little details and minor modifications are needed in different areas. I did have high hopes for the new Paragon 4 decoder, and while it seems to be a little bit better with several improvements over the Paragon 3, my model showed examples that the kinks are not all the way worked out. This might be an individual issue on mine, or it might be a larger issue across the board, but I haven't seen any evidence to back up the larger issue. Overall, I would say the Broadway FEF Class 3 met exactly where my expectations were at. It is a gorgeous model that pulls like a beast and sounds great. Like any scale model, there are limitations and this example is no exception. That being said, for several years, the FEF was extremely strained with little competition and low supply numbers. And now we'll have two major releases in less than a year. And my recommendation is if you've owned a BLI and know the brand and the model expectations, then I would recommend getting this model to anyone. Otherwise, Atherin Genesis is set to release theirs in late spring 2022, and it may be beneficial to wait a little bit and see the comparison between the two models. That's all I got for you guys in the time being. Tell me what you guys think about this amazing model from BLI, and if you're going to be picking up this one, or if you're going to wait for the others. See you next time, and thanks for watching.